Hello everyone, um, welcome back to the podcast. Um, in today's episode, um, it's, a, it's a special episode for the 60th anniversary of Doctor Who. Um, today I'm joined with Yi, and Yi um, was in the Doctor Who TV movie, and also has Crohn's, um, which um, it, 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 it's going to be good to hear about his journey with Crohn's as well. So Yi, it's great to have you on today. How are you doing? Yeah, thanks Mason. No, I'm doing all right. Yeah. Um, so with um how about we start with Crohn's first, just so um because I, I, I didn't know you had Crohn's. So when did all that all kind of start for you? When was you diagnosed? <clears throat> yeah, uh so I, I it was I honestly the exact date escapes me because a lot happens and it was a while ago, but um it was the twenty twelve or twenty thirteen, I think was when um and it, it wasn't necessarily like I mean, it was a surprise, but I have uh, also have like ankylosing spondylitis and iritis. There's this like triumvirate of conditions that um, happen together with a lot of people. Um, and there's like genetic marker for it. It's called HLA B27. And that's so that's how, you know, that's how, that's, you know, part of the whole deal of like stuff that um, that that I get to manage or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it is. It, it's tough because once you have Crohn's you can you can get other stuff from it as well mm, yeah yeah that's true yeah yeah I mean yeah and I, I gotta say like all things said and done I'm I consider myself to be fairly lucky because I don't have I so far haven't had like really really severe flare-ups I've had you know I haven't had a, a thing where I had to do like overnight hospital stays or anything like that so it's been mostly being been able to be managed it's been mostly manageable, like with just, you know, at, at home management. I see the, I see my GI specialist and I see my doctor um, when flare ups happen, but I don't have to necessarily, I, I haven't had to stay at the hospital. So that's, you know, that's kind of a nice yeah. curve. Yeah. It's, it, it's good because, of course, it, it impacts everyone differently um, yeah. who, who has um, Crohn's, but um, it's good that you, you haven't had to do that because a lot of people do. Um, yeah do that so it's yeah it's good um with um so do you take anything at the moment like me, like any like tablets or anything um uh yeah no i'm um i i don't i don't manage it with medication per se it's mostly um mostly uh dietary stuff but also like uh, i have some topical um uh, medications uh, and, um, and I mean, for the, for the ankylosing spondylitis, I have anti-inflammatories and stuff like that, but I haven't gone on any of the, um, biologics yet. They, they've talked about it. Um, the, yeah. my GI specialist and rheumatologist and doctor have like sort of, you know, talked about when flare-ups happen, you know, they're like, oh, well, you know, we can consider it, but they, they've never, they've never actually like, you know, um, taken the step to get me on those. Cause it's a bit of a commitment, right? Like, and I think that they're kind of holding off for, if it becomes like really, really necessary versus just like a nice to have. <laughs> <laughs> it's scary stuff to go on as well because it really dampens your immune system, doesn't it? Right. Yeah. 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 And especially lately in the last, you know, like when, when, when uh, COVID happened and all that, they're being really kind of careful about doing that. So, yeah. Yeah. I've been on, uh, well, I was diagnosed in 2017, um, quite late on. So, October time. So, similar time to now really um just at the end of the month um near, near halloween um but um so i was i was put on steroids at the start and then after that um i went on um i buy lot 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 um so it was something called infliximab and it was an infusion oh, yeah, yeah. it was an infusion and I was advised to start a Himera, which was where you just inject yourself. Um, mm. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be in the hospital care because I was it's new to me. And I don't know what Crohn's is. Like, I don't know much about it myself. So I wanted to be in the hospital at the time. And it worked out because when COVID hit, mm. it's when I near enough started my Himera. It was just before. So I could do that at home. And it was mm. easier. And you don't want to be in hospital with, with COVID happening. It's, right. it's the worst place to be. So, yeah. um, but the thing I don't like is because I take medication as well. So I take azathioprine, vitamin D, um, B12, so with fatigue. So mm. um, in an ideal world, it's, it's, it's not, it helps, but at the same time, 
you don't want it to be on it because how it can cause other things happening as well. Yeah. Yeah, it can be quite impactful. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because the, you know, the anti-inflammatories that I take for the Angspawn um will exacerbate the the Crohn's too, right? So there's this like it's almost like you're you're kind of like playing whack-a-mole with these different things that pop up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 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 kind of like that because you never know what it's gonna be like tomorrow. Yeah. But, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's very unpredictable. Yeah. It makes it it makes it hard to like plan around things. You know, I'm sure you've had the same experience where you like plan some event or even something like this you know, an inter interview or if you've got a, a, a meeting or something or, you know, like worst case, you've got travel plans and you've paid for plane tickets and all this kind of stuff. And then like a flare up happens and it's like, wow, everything <laughs> just goes to pot. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 something that people can't understand um, because when I was diagnosed, I was at school um, at, at, at that time and it was when the exams were going on. So it was a, last year at school, it was. Mm -hmm. And um it was annoying because i was part of this drama course where i would play a multi-role character so okay. i was about three or four people and mm. it was it was limited so it's about six of us because uh, the exam changed it was more of a written thing than yeah. the acting um and as far as i'm aware i was the last from the score went to they don't do drama anymore like the exam because it's too hard <laughs> okay <laughs> um, right yeah. Um, yeah but so they were really understanding, but the annoying thing is that, that I, I'd say I, I was one of the, the, the most crucial parts because I played more than one character. So um, it was hard. It, it wasn't an ideal time to get diagnosed, especially with something that you had no idea what it was in the first place. So. Right. Yeah. 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 The first the first bit of it, like the first you know year or two years or something um, after diagnosis is is the most sort of you're like, what? You just have no, you know, you have no idea what to do. You know, it and for me that was that was the most impactful from a symptoms standpoint as well. Like early on, it, it kind of it has gotten somewhat better over over time. You know, a little bit. So, um, yeah, yeah. But I learned a lot. You, you know, you learn a lot about things like, um, you know, what what kind of dietary, what kind of impact like different foods have on your system and so forth, right? And and like and sleep for example, or like, just like how all these different things are related to your health. It's crazy. Yeah. It is it, so much changes um, to something that you may have thought was a little bug at the time um, to something that it's not, the, it's, it's a disease. Um, mm. And I think like it, it's when you get told you have this, um, I got told that it was some rare. So me automatically thinking it's rare. Am I one of the only people in the world that has Crohn's because <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, what right. I was thinking. Um, but then you find out there's loads of people around the world that have it as well. Is that uh, you can find a community of, of, of folks who, even if something is like relatively rare in the like greater population, you can definitely uh, like find a community and, and, and find some support or whatever. Right. Yeah. Definitely, it's it is it, it has a lot. A big community is out mm -hmm. there. Um, mm -hmm. It does take a little while to speak about it. I think maybe it, like yeah. this, like like light, light this. It does, yeah. Right, right, yeah. Like not everyone is like really comfortable about talking about it, especially like if they're new to the diagnosis. It's it might seem a little bit like they don't want to get into it or whatever. But I, you know, a, a, after whatever it's been a, a decade or maybe more for me um i i'm gotten more comfortable with it <laughs> yeah yeah it took me about maybe three years as soon as yeah. covid happened i thought oh, i'll go talk about it because i'm bored <laughs> i'm bored at home can't yeah. go out um <laughs> and like in a way i felt it, it's a way that people who were locked in could relate to people maybe like me and you that hmm. have these you can't go out and people how it affected people's mental health who maybe don't have Crohn's or a chronic illness. They might yep. relate in a way where they're isolated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean that one of the silver linings about the pandemic was that it really put a highlight on mental health issues and how important and, and core mental health issues are for, for everybody. We just hadn't, you know, when I was growing up, you didn't, 
you didn't talk about neurodivergence. You didn't talk about, you didn't get diagnoses for things. You didn't have individualized education plans. You know, you didn't have any of that stuff. Uh, and, and, you know, and like I had undiagnosed like anxiety and OCD for, for like, you know, decades. Some pretty bad decisions based on the fact that I really didn't understand what was going on with my, with my own brain. Right. And, and, you know, whereas it's getting better now, like now people are able to at least kind of, you know, talk about it more. And I, I think that is in part due to the pandemic where it's like, e even if you didn't have any kind of genetic predisposition or you didn't have any kind of like diagnosable sort of um, uh, mental health issues, the pandemic kind of made that true for like pretty much everyone, right? Like, it's like, <laughs> if you didn't have anxiety before the pandemic, you had it after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, it, it, I completely agree. And um, I think you find if you have a chronic illness like Crohn's, you're not just going to have Crohn's, you end up having mm -hmm. something else. It might be beforehand or afterwards, but um, yeah. I find very rare people that have had, uh, say, autism and Crohn's or they have some sort of neuro neurodivergent. And yeah. when I was younger, those words weren't even used, like new, new, yeah. neurodivergent and stuff like that. Um, and it, it's, it's a complicated word too, because it means so many different things. It's like a bracket of all these different things, like dyspraxia, ADHD, autism. So it's, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, it's uh, interesting times we're living in. We all are trying to adjust to it. Some people are, you know, kind of rejecting the idea and don't want to deal with it. And other people are sort of just trying to figure out what it means for them. And and other people are really embracing it because it kind of speaks to them, right? So, I mean, we're all going to react to these kinds of things differently, but culturally, there's definitely been some kind of shift, you know, I think. Yeah. It's, 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 it's like when um, in the UK, when um, it was locked down, um, especially on people's mental health, like on each day, they would show on the news how many people have died from COVID that day. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm thinking, hang on a minute. Yeah, loads of people will die, but loads of people die every day anyway. Um, right. So you don't show that on the news. And that can affect people's mental health. And it was getting to a stage where you don't want to see it anymore. Like you get these announcements on your phone as it is. So just turn the telly off and do something else that you that, that may distract yeah. you from that. Yeah, it was definitely a, an exercise in like in in managing that. I don't think I did it very well because, you know, I mean, I, 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 my, I got my I was diagnosed with anxiety like before COVID. So I was already kind of that was already something I managed. But like during COVID, it just got it just got way worse, ended up being pretty much agoraphobic, like did not leave the house like at all. And even like the front porch was off limits, right? Like you start to limit your field of, of you know, whatever. And anyway, so the um, but and the new like I had to just shut I mean, I couldn't watch the news. There was no, there was no way I could turn the news on or look at like a Twitter feed or something. That just wasn't, it just wasn't something I could do. You know, like yeah, it it was really tough. And I found because they they restricted they restricted everyone to go outside. So um, what I, what I did was I went outside because um, for people like us who got Crohn's and vul are very vulnerable and I compromised. I felt, hang on a minute, it's, it, no, everyone's going to be inside. So this is the mm -hmm. best opportunity for me to mm -hmm. go outside when no, where everyone's inside. So I think <laughs> that's what they should have done. They should have allowed everyone who was vulnerable uh -huh. in that high category to go outside and mm -hmm. be outside while everyone else is inside because that's even more isolating to be inside yeah. while everyone else is inside. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, there's definitely, you know, the way that it was managed, you know, globally in different countries and in some, you know, there, there was like something left to be desired, I think, and no no matter which. But I mean, to the credit of, you know, the to people who had to make those decisions, we, we hadn't we hadn't gone through something like that before. Like the last time we had it was the last time we had something like that was, I think, the pandemic in the 1800s late 1800s or something which was far more devastating because we i mean we have in terms of just sheer numbers because we do have you know we had the 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 vaccines and whatnot right so so i mean i think overall i know it was terrible and i hated it and you know i wish it never happened but we fared 
pretty well all things considered you know like <laughs> yeah we we did all right um but i think the thing to remember is um that now it looks like it's all been forgotten about um hasn't oh, it right. like like it's almost like it's been a dream um yeah. like we've we fast traveled in time we fast, yeah. we fast traveled in the tardis and it's, it's not there anymore and like um these little things, I I don't know if you picked them up as well, you. But like j- just like hygiene things, um, mm. was w- one of the reasons why we probably was on the pandemic in the first place. Um, but um, like the hygiene for for example, elevators, everyone touching mm. their hands on them. What well, one yeah. thing I do quite often when going to the football, um, is I'm in the car and I'm analysing people, you know, and I'll like so they'll go to the burger van, and mm. they'll to get their burger and then they'll have the ketchup and mustard on the side uh mm. put the ketchup in it which everyone has touched um yeah. not washing that no thoughts of washing hands beforehand or after they've done that they eat the burger they lick the fingers and then oh. that's that that's how bugs spread and then each person's doing that um yeah. and then i'm thinking hang on a minute surely this isn't i'm not just thinking this because i've got crohn's and I'm susceptible to maybe catching other things and getting ill maybe quicker or badder than mm. everyone else. And I'm thinking, hang on a minute, even if I didn't have Crohn's, I would still be wary of that kind of stuff, still wash my hands. I don't know if yeah. you're like that as well, but I find it bizarre. Yeah, I think about that stuff a lot. Uh, yeah, it definitely. Um, I mean, part of it is part of it is probably to the extreme. Like, so the OCD aspect of it is that you kind of like take certain thoughts and even actions or whatever to like and emotions to to sort of an extreme level and so like uh uh, and 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 it's like it's a little bit like i kind of wish i could sort of get rid of it because like it takes some cognitive load to be like tracing tracing the steps of things that i've touched or like you know doing that thing where you're you're kind of like thinking about you know what had you know what things have touched what other things and like kind of tra- drawing this line and, and, you know, in- inevitably it ends up being somewhere kind of disastrous. Right. So, so in a way, like I kind of wish that, or not wish I'm working on kind of like limiting how, how much I, I, uh, I, I sort of go down the rabbit hole with, with these thoughts or whatever, but yes, absolutely. Those are things that I'm thinking about, like literally all the time, like anytime I'm in a public place, you know, I, I only touch doors with my elbow. Um, I like wash the sink, like faucets with soap before I wash my hands. And then I wash my hands really thoroughly. And then I wash the faucet and then I use the paper towel to, you know, touch things afterwards. And like, you know, just very like specific sort of like routines around like hygiene. I think it's probably extreme. Like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm guessing it's probably extreme and it's probably not all hundred percent necessary, but I don't see how anyone can just walk into a bathroom and touch things and not be totally freaked out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, especially a public one. So yeah. if I go yeah. to the toilet in a public bathroom, um, I will not use the soap and people may look at me in there thinking, hang on a minute, you're not being very hygienic. And I am, but I'm just, I'm just don't, everyone's touched that tap, everyone's touched that soap. I've got my own in my pocket. I always bring right. up uh, my own. So, and I will, I will take a tissue, like anti-back wipes, open the doors yeah. and I won't even shake. Yeah. If, I, if I meet someone new, the, the stigma around meeting people new is handshakes. They right. always, it's always a handshake and to not be rude, um, mm. I will, I'll be like, let's do elbows instead. It's, it's so much cooler. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, because you, you don't know where their hands been. Um, no. And earlier this year, I did a talk around autism at a um, at this conference thing. Um, mm. And before before my speech with the leader, we spoke to this person that I had to hand over for the next person for the speech. Mm. Um, and I, I met them, and I they had their hands out in front of me. And because I did, I was anxious and and I didn't say much. I was very quiet, and I said, "The first, I didn't explain my situation or anything. I didn't say how Crohn's because I don't like to b- b- go on about it um, hmm. to people that maybe may not understand." Um, right. But I, but they said, "Nice to meet you, Mason." Had the handshake, like the hand hmm. ready, and I yeah. was like, so I, I stepped back saying, "Sorry, I I don't do handshakes." And hmm. then she hmm. was. The two person who's neuro- neurodivergent and autistic, um, 
her, the person's approach wasn't good. It was oh. very sarcastic. So what they did was they, they said to me, oh, great. So to, to me, that was sarcastic because the way she oh. was saying it. Um, and then the funny thing is, this particular person did her speech and then went home <laughs> straight afterwards. Um, hey. But yeah, it's, it's, it's just those things. I think there's a, a really big stigma around that, that everyone has to have a handshake when they meet new people. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I mean... I don't really think it's all that necessary. I mean, I, I don't, you, you know, I've been doing even with like friends and so, well, luckily with, with friends and, and whatnot, like there's an, there's, there's an understanding there and usually people are fine with doing like a fist bump or an elbow or something like that. Um, yeah. yeah I, 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 some people still want to shake hands, I guess it's all right. But then I'm thinking about my hand until I get a chance to go to the washroom and like wash it. Right. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like you can, like, I don't know. That's, but again, like also, you know, I'm aware that some of those thoughts or the, that line of thinking is is a little bit extreme. And I kind of have to learn being somebody that tends towards extreme sort of thoughts. I need to, you know, always, always kind of think about it from the other side, too, and go, hey, am I, you know, is this is this absolutely necessary? And is there an adjustment that I can make? Would it make my life better if I was to adjust this? Right. Like it's it's a it's a constant sort of management thing. But, eh, you know, we all have challenges and this is yeah anyway. <laughs> yeah we, we, we always have those we always have them um so with the crones um <laughs> is there certain foods that you stick to i know you like you have a diet but is there ones that you are your go-tos that you you you, you go to these certain foods that that are that have always been okay with you or at the moment they're, they're good, good with you yeah well and the thing is it's, it's funny because it's different for everyone like for for some people like dairy is an absolute no-go um whereas for me well i mean it's different depending on like if there's a flare if, there, if i have an active flare-up i'm not eating anything right like it's like liquid only kind of thing maybe, maybe i'll have like chicken broth or something like that but it's very very much just like no solid food like you know pretty much pretty much fasting like just because you know, I can't imagine really eating anything if I'm actually having a flare up. But, um, but, uh, but the usual case is that I, I kind, I do, I do, I do avoid like, um, I do avoid certain foods. I don't, I try to avoid like eating a lot. I don't, I'm not like, I don't have to be like super, super strict about gluten. Like I, I have, uh, we have some friends who are, um, who have celiac disease, for example, who are like they can't even you know, they, they really have to be strict about avoiding gluten and they can't have even traces of gluten on their plate. And, and it's very, very extreme. Whereas, you know, I'm, I'm lucky that way. I don't have to be that diligent about it. Um, so if there's something that has gluten in, in the, you know, in the recipe or something, it's, it's generally fine. I just try not to heap on the, you know, bread and, and, uh, and, and pasta and, 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 and whatnot. Um, but I do find that like fermented foods, uh, are really good like so I I probably consume like more fermented food than like most people so I drink a lot of kefir or eat, eat a lot of kefir based things or like um really uh um uh like yogurt that's been fermented a long time or or um you know just that kind of thing um and even though it's dairy I find because it's for it because it's fermented it seems to be totally good for me so yeah 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 it's it's always good. I think it's good to try always try new things as well because you you never know how yeah. it's gonna react as too. Yeah. Um, for me, I've when I was diagnosed, I couldn't eat anything, so I had this horrible pain in, in my stomach, um, where I was bloated before. I had a whole meal in front of me, couldn't eat anything. So I, yeah. I, I I I lived on chicken at the start of it. I I, I it's the only thing I could really eat. Um, hmm. so. And then I had to move away from spicy foods, so mm. I I couldn't have spicy foods. Yeah, spicy food doesn't work for me either. Um, yeah, I I really love the flavor of certain yeah. spicy foods, but I can't really do it anymore. I I loved it. Like beforehand, I would have a kebab every once in a while, have the chili sauce over it all, mm. and I like mm. the the feeling of having a drink of water every mm. few seconds. I would just like it, and people think I'm mad, um, but <laughs> um, but. <laughs> Now every once in a while, if I'm doing a care of my Crohn's, I'll I'll have it, but I won't pour it like I used to. I just have yeah. it on the side, maybe dip a few chips 
or yeah. something. Um, but yeah, it, it's annoying because I, I love spicy foods. I, 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 I love the hot curry and stuff mm. like that, but it's one of those sacrifices we have to make, fortunately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I mean, pain is the greatest motivator, right? So I kind of just like use the, I, I, I kind of use the motivation that you, you get from like wanting to avoid, you know, the pain and suffering that comes with certain kinds of foods. And I, I kind of like, you know, you kind of tr- turn that around and get, you know, get yourself to do things like go f- going for a walk or, or instead of snacking or whatever, or like just, you know, kind of fasting through a day instead of like, instead of, you know, it kind of, it can be, you know, it can be a tool in a way. Right. So I, I don't know if anyone else has had that experience where, you know, you just kind of turn, turn it around for yourself and, and it can help, it can help kind of keep, keep yourself diligent about things, but I don't know that it probably wouldn't work for for everybody or it's like everyone's different, but that's one sort of tool that I've realized is, is available to me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. Um, drink wise, I can't have caffeine. So I, I have to have stuff that's decaffeinated. So well, whenever I go into a coffee shop, I'm always asking no decaf. No, no, right. I, I can't have any decaf. Well, to me, it don't taste any different because I do remember having caffeine. Um, yeah which isn't entirely good for us, but um, I I would like it because the Crohn's impacts our fatigue, so it makes us tired. tired so um, yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd love caffeine, but uh, right. I don't have it. <laughs> it's funny. I've had the, I've had an opposite. So everybody's different, right? Like I, I had the opposite thing where I, I, uh, caffeine seems to be okay for me. Like I can still drink coffee and, and tea and whatnot. I, I, at in, but after, after in the afternoon, um that doesn't work because it messes up with my sleep or whatever and if i try to drink decaf that messes up my stomach like that causes mm-hmm. issues for me right like which is you know it's kind of like the opposite which is weird because i guess everyone's different but um but yeah like um but you but i mean i think what's common here is that you're like paying attention right like to what you're putting in your body and what what foods are work for you and what what food. so you almost become an expert in your own sort of like your dietary like what what works for your body you become an expert in that whereas if you didn't have to think about it you wouldn't well you wouldn't think about it you wouldn't know you wouldn't know what to think about it really <laughs> yeah we have to know um but we, we have to be the bot like if we go for doctors or hospital appointments we, we have to be the ones in charge is our bodies our choice like, yep. like, 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 like when you said about um you got advice to have like go on the biologics and you didn't mm. want to do that so that's your choice it's no one else's choice to decide what happens to you yeah 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 that's a good lesson as well right like to know that you know you're the only person who, who's really going to be in charge of your own health is is you like like thinking that we could kind of like have the doctors take charge or whatever it's it's not it doesn't happen like that they, they've got a hundred other patients to deal with and they're not going to take charge of your health it's just not going to happen <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> No, but um, have you met many other people with Crohn's? Um, yeah. Um, I do know a few other people with Crohn's. Yeah, an old friend of mine. Yes, I do. I know maybe like two or three people fairly closely that have Crohn's, and or maybe yeah, maybe like two, and then a couple others like not not I don't know them that well, but I know that they they have Crohn's and you know they're sort of associated through friends or whatever, and then and then a few other people with like similar but not the same like you know um, ulcerative colitis or 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 like celiac disease or something like that, right? Like that yeah. are you know in the same kind of vein but not not really the same thing. Yeah, yeah, it's it's good to know a few people. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah but uh it's good to see you doing all right at the moment with it with, with yeah, your it's going okay right now yeah knock on wood <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that's really good um so moving on to um doctor who um mm-hmm. so with um who you play chan lee um yeah. and, and le- leading up to this i actually rewatched the movie today um oh, cool. um so I could um I, I watched it once before, um mm. when I interviewed Paul McGann um a, a, a little while ago um for nice. people for people listening that that would just be the twenty third November but um but yeah so how that how did that all kind of start then with um coming on Doctor Who um 
yeah they they so they were shooting they were planning on doing or they initially they'd plan on doing a series um uh, in north america for that right so it was like a a, a fox universal bbc co-production and they decided to film it in vancouver so i live in vancouver i'm an actor in vancouver there was auditions the casting director that was casting for it had we'd worked together on a on a show before um but you know there there was like a few there was a bunch of actors that went out for it and just kind of went through multiple audition um steps or whatever uh the, the whole process um as it happens I was uh after the after we shot the thing and I think before it came out maybe I can't remember if it come out yet um we were at a uh F Philip Siegel the producer and a bunch of us were at a convention um I'm pretty sure it was the one in LA it was either one the one in LA or the one in Chicago it was either Visions or um or Gallifrey in LA I can't remember now anyway uh, one of these conventions and somebody asked them like oh why did you cast you know why did you cast EG for the for the role of Jang Lee and I was like and you know he told this story from his perspective and I'm paraphrasing because obviously I don't it's, it was a long time ago so I don't remember exactly what he said but basically told the story of the fact that like um, they had all been they, they were they were meant to they they'd seen the other actors already and they were I was the last last one I think and they were meant to uh, um you know, do do one more audition with me and then they would make their decision or whatever. And uh, they were sitting around like I was nowhere to be found. They they, they were like waiting for a long time for, for, for me to show up. And from my perspective, I recall driving down, there's this like highway that goes to where the studio was that they held the audition. And, and I, I live downtown and like it's a, it's a pretty, pretty long stretch of highway that is like heavily trafficked often. And I just like was very bad at leaving myself enough time. So I was like quite late to that audition. I want to say like almost an hour late. And, you know, if you're auditioning for things, if you're an actor auditioning for things, it's like you don't do that. Like, I mean, you may as well just kiss this part goodbye if you're going to be late to an audition. You can't keep like producer. They, they had people from like they had like network like executives and things. The director was there. The producer was there. Like, you don't you're not definitely like you're pretty much guaranteed to never, ever, ever be able to book a role if you're late to an audition, right? Especially to the last call back. Like that. Anyway, they waited around somehow for some reason. And um, and I showed up and I did the audition. I have no idea how the audition even went because I'm pretty sure I was just like, oh, I blew it. Like, I'm just going to whatever. It's just I just kind of, you know, just did it without thinking about it, really, I think at that point. And uh and so at the convention where Philip Siegel is talking about this event, he was like, it really seemed like he had this, like, I don't care about anything, you know, this, like, you know, this, uh, this sort of uh, cavalier kind of attitude about everything. And that was what we wanted for Chang Lee. So we we're like, this is the guy, like, we're going to hire this, this is the right person for the role because of this cavalier attitude. And, uh, and so it's just, it's kind of ironic because, you know, as, as an actor, you think like, oh, you know, if I just do this, if I just do that, if I like, there are all these things that you kind of like strive for in order to be like more successful or whatever. And nowadays that's more true that you have some more agency over that. Cause you can do things like, you know, make a production and put it up on YouTube or whatever, or you can do social media stuff and you can kind of self promote like a lot, but in the nineties, none of that stuff existed. Right. It was like, Oh, you just like take acting classes and maybe produce your own theater show or something. And um, and it was like a lot of money to produce film. So you weren't really going to do that just to try to further your acting career, mostly unless you had gobs of cash. Anyway, long story short, it's like, uh, you know, you, you you strive to do these things as an actor to further your career. And at the end of the day, it kind of boils down to luck in a way. Right. Like yeah. it's like they really got the impression that I had the right attributes for the character because like, hey, I couldn't schedule enough time to get to the studio, you know, and I was late. <laughs> Right, like I don't know. Anyway, yeah, I'm happy yeah. that I was. Yeah, all, all happens by luck, and you got it. <laughs> it is a lot. Yeah, it's it's a lot of it's a lot of luck. I think people have a difficult. I think a lot of people have difficulty like accepting the fact that there's that that a lot of that their success that luck contributes in a significant way to anyone's success because they want to feel like they worked for it, that they quote unquote deserve it. Right. Like, Oh, well, I, you know, I went to, I went to school for this and I worked really hard and like, I deserve this. Like I, you know, I, I made this for myself and they can feel a sense of agency and sort of like self empowerment out of that, which is all, they're all, those are all great things. But I mean, at the end of the day, 
like you can't count how many things that have contributed to any one person's success or failure that is actually out of their direct control, right? Like where you were born, what your relationship with your parents were, like what socioeconomic status that you were like born into, the people that you meet, the school that you went to, the circle that you hang out in, like all these things that you really didn't directly control and yet contribute in these like vastly unknowable ways to, you know, how, to your prognosis in life, right? Like, yeah. and I don't know, I think giving credit to that is, I, I personally, I like that in a way, right? Yeah, it, it, it's all done, I guess, how it's supposed to be. Um, and, and and things like Doctor Who, and it's, it's one of those shows that, I guess, like, hearing it from, like, at this point of view, say, what people I spoke to before, they say it's nothing like they've been in, like, all the other jobs as an actor, it's not like anything else that you've been in yeah. because it's like that long show that you could be known for being Chan Lee for or, or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, that's, that's really true. Actually. It's very special that way. I still get invited to conventions and I still, um, you know, if I'm in the UK, I can generally get a hold of pretty much every time I've been in the UK, I've done something with big finish, for example, uh, big finish. I'm not sure if you're, you're aware of the, the audios that big finish makes they are considered, canon in terms of like doc their doctor who um library and and so they're they're you know they're very often uh you know we, we're working together on something when i'm when i'm in the uk and and uh and those kinds of opportunities would never have come up without the doc like you know i mean maybe maybe some other lucky path would have me encounter big finish somehow some other way but i can't imagine it like i can't think of how that would happen so yeah but um from the movie you like do you have any iconic moments like any favorite bits from it that you you enjoyed yeah well there was a i don't know if you'd call it favorite per se it's certainly the most memorable um and i actually have a book called time and spaces that i i put together with some photos that i took like on set uh and and you know i scanned some of the things that I have from there, like the the schedules and the scripts and, and whatnot. And I kind of put it together with a little narrative and made a made a photo book called Time and Spaces. Um, and and I talk about this in there. So I, I don't want people to be feeling like, I, you know, I don't have I just keep repeating the same story over and over again. But that's what I'm doing. I'm repeating the same story. Anyway, um, it's the situation where uh, we were um, it was at the it was the scene at the end where it was like there was like fireworks going off and and, you know, the doctor was like leaving and the TARDIS is sitting in this like up on this hill kind of thing and like and there was this um uh there was actually this uh, it was shot at a location where it was actually a water feature it was like this big pond basically like an artificial pond and they had these like you walk across it on these sort of sort of like concrete slabs almost like a pathway basically through the you know and so and there's a photo of it. the reason why i mentioned the book is there's an actual photo of it in the book you can kind of see the the where the crew and the camera and everything they all had to be kind of like kind of just placed in certain spots like around this water feature and they were kind of filming and you couldn't you couldn't see it in the tv movie but like for some of the dialogue we were actually standing on these like concrete sort of tile things like, like and there was water all around us right and so I'm standing on one of these things and we're about to shoot or whatever. And, and I was just, I don't really recall anything other than like, I was kind of just standing there waiting for something to happen. And all of a sudden I felt this like pull on my chest, right? Like this kind of like, just like, Ooh, this feeling of like vertigo or whatever. And bam, I was in the drink. Like I was like, right. I was in the water, fully wet, everything completely covered head to toe in water. I don't know how I didn't like bonk my head on something or whatever, but, um, <laughs> But anyway, like, so, and this was like met with mixed enthusiasm, right? Like most of the crew were like having a, a laugh and thought it was a great thing. Uh, but the wardrobe department was like, oh no, because they didn't have, I don't know if you recall, the Chang, Chang Lee had um, a certain jacket. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like he had this, you know, whatever. And they didn't have doubles of those um, at the, you know, for whatever reason, they only had one copy of it. So, so uh and me, my having gotten it all wet, they just immediately had to like take all of the clothes, go in and like try to get them to the dryer in the, the in the in the wardrobe truck, dry them, get them back, and all while we're like right about to shoot. It's like they really only had like thirty seconds 
to kind of do final touches. And now we have to take like however many minutes to do this other thing, right? So that was pretty memorable. Um, I don't like getting wet. I have the same reaction to water as like my cat, um, you know, just like don't like it. But it was uh, it made for a memory. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I I recall from like the first uh, at, at the beginning when you're running from those guys at the start of it. And then yeah, mm. you're in the TARDIS for like you're teleported through the TARDIS. That that mm. that, that that is quite a good first scene because mm, yeah, fun. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's in Chinatown. That's actually just like eight blocks from my house. Um, okay. so uh, so there's um there's an alleyway over here called Rose Alley, and it's it's um you know part of historic Chinatown where you know it used to be probably like one of the main streets, and now it's just like an alleyway behind Main Street kind of thing, and and uh. And you can visit it like one of the buildings that was there while we were filming is still there. And if you kind of place yourself, I tried to do this with the with my camera and like put some photos in the book where I kind of like overlay what it looks like today with like where the TARDIS was standing when we filmed it, for example. And then it had this false wall there. And so you can kind of see the difference of like, hey, this is what this place actually looks like. And then this is what happens after the the cast, the, the crew got in there and like created this whole environment. Right. It was really cool. And and so, yeah. And so it, it was. um uh, it was one of those shoots where like it took a really long time and it was a lot of work. But I think at the end, it turned out really, really well. Um, like that shoot was like we spent a week in Chinatown. Uh, it was cold. It was like, you know, cold, like Vancouver cold. So not like negative 50, but it was like pretty close to freezing. And uh, and we were outside at night. Well, not even just at night, daytime, too. But it was like. 18 hour days just just trying to get through this all the shots in this location they had special effects they got fake walls put up like cordon off the whole neighborhood you know it was a big deal mm. uh and so that week was just like it just blurred by it was like literally like i don't know 80 hours on set and just just or more 18 18 times five whatever 90 hours on set that week just cranking it through just just, just all you know <laughs> so it's, it's it's crazy well well when I, I I was here when when people are filming stuff, it's always not in the correct order. So you'll be doing mm. something like I don't know if it's like a series, you'll be doing episode eight first and episode yeah. one is, is later on. And you don't. It, it's really clever how TV works now because you'll go in one separate location and it's almost like it's in the same location, but you're somewhere totally different for the next part or yeah. the next scene. Yeah. Yeah, it's really neat. Yeah, that was one of the things that drew me to film and TV in the first place is that this sort of disjunction of reality, right? Like you've got like what's actually happening and then what's happening on screen and both of those are existing at the same time. It's pretty cool. Yeah, like what, what one thing I love to do um, like these last two years, I'll, I'll go and find Doctor Who locations. Um, oh, yeah, neat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And... I've been, I was actually like considering doing a tour like... um. I haven't actually put it together yet. I don't know how it would work. People would have to travel to Vancouver, obviously, but I would do like a walking tour because you can actually visit probably probably within like two or three hours. You can visit, I want to say like most, if not all, most of the sets that were used in the, in the TV movie. So for if anyone was like, you know, if anyone is like a, a big fan of the of the tv movie and i know it kind of sits in this weird spot right like it's between the classic series and the new series and it's kind of but a few folks out there you know they 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 grew up at that time and like the tv movie was their sort of like their entry into 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 uh into doctor who and for those who were super interested in it like i don't know hit me up on on twitter or or go to my website or something like that and 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 send me a message and if because i, I i'm curious if people would be interested in doing a tour it'd be kind of it i think it would be kind of neat yeah, it 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 would be nice. So, like, for instance, a scene that you was in, like, mm -hmm. like it, it, in the movie. So it, we talk about maybe from the first scene, from where the TARDIS was, and like you had, I think you had, it's where you, uh, the seventh Doctor's on the floor at yeah. at, at the beginning. Uh, yeah. you, you could react that scene. Um, yeah, yeah. And do a side by side photo. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like yeah. now and then. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. I could like people could people could if they wanted to like we could take photos of people like in that exact spot. Like it's literally right there. Like it. I had dinner there like yesterday with with my wife and and son. Right. Like it was like it's like right there. I walk by it pretty much every day. 
So yeah. it's, it's a really weird, it's a really weird thing. That, and and like, that's why I kind of got the idea for the book to do those photos, like you said, right? Let's try to match it up right. to, you know, and then, but if people were like visiting, they could actually have their own photos taken in that, you know, and yeah, yeah, yeah. like lying down where Sylvester was and like, it'd be pretty cool, I think. Anyway. It, 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 it was really cool because earlier this year, I saw David Tennant and I went to the one of the locations that he was at. It was, mm-hmm. it was it was one of his episodes, the girl in the fireplace, it was called. He was going above the rock. He was leaning. And I did the exact same thing with his clothes that he wore. Yeah. And I had a photo. So when I had a photo of him, made him hold it. And then yeah. when I met him and spoke to him, I said, do you, do, you, do you remember like 15 years ago or so? He's standing there. And I'm standing there now. He just laughed. <laughs> so yeah, right. it's quite funny when you do those kind of things. Because I'll do it if I go to a Doctor Who location in the UK because nowhere near where I live, but it's Cardiff and that's where Doctor Who is now. So you'll get all these different locations, um, mm. which is really cool because you talk about it to people who maybe it might be at a church and they'll say, yep, yeah, Doctor Who's over there. And it's, it's, it's very cool. It's, it's very cool. Yeah, neat. neat. Yeah, yeah, it's totally fun. Yeah, right very on. Cool. Um, so before in Doctor, before you was in Doctor Who, what was you a fan of it? Did you watch it prior to you going in it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I was a kid, I was sort of like what they would call like a latchkey kid. A, a lot of my generation, you know, had this like term or whatever because you know our parents were pretty busy, like or really busy, like working and stuff. So you know, I'd get home and basically my my thing was I would and this is not I don't recommend this. Like, like lots of issues have popped up from doing this, but. Like I would get home from school and I would just like turn the TV on and then I'd set up like this little desk in front of the t- in front of the couch or whatever. And I'd sit on the floor and kind of do my homework. And but like I'd be watching TV at the same time. I would do this like for the entire night. And uh, because the only person around was my grandmother who didn't speak English. So I was like, for all intents and purposes, like alone, uh, didn't really have like a formal dinner type thing or anything. I mean, this is like oh, sometimes we did, but like a lot of the times this was my life. And and so one of the thing one of the th- shows that was playing you know was was Doctor Who it was the Tom Baker era because um, I remember clearly the hat and the scarf and everything and I remember the you know uh, but in but the thing is like watching TV like that it's like I don't have a very clear memory of any of the plots I didn't really like get into any of the shows but I remember all the theme songs you know like. There was like Doctor Who, but then there was also, you know, like all the other ones. There's like Brady's Brady Bunch, you know, even like I stayed up to watch like Three's Company or like Knight Rider or like Airwolf, you know, all these American like shows like that. Um, and a bunch of, you know, and also some occasionally a Canadian one too. Um, kids shows to adult shows. I just like watched everything. Everything just kind of like just full on streamed into my brain, but I don't like super recall anything in particular. So yeah, I mean, I knew what Doctor Who who was. I just wasn't necessarily like a, a diehard fan of any show in particular. I was more of a fan of like all like just TV in general, you know? <laughs> yeah. And hence why you became an actor. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, that's probably is one of the reasons. Well, another reason too, is that like I found when I was younger, I, I really like didn't have a lot of a I didn't have a lot of awareness about my own like emotional life. <clears throat> I, I had depression. I didn't really know. Um, and, and, uh, and it was like very, it was very, it felt very disconnected with my emotions. And one of the things I recall, you know, trying to be in, intentional about learning more or being more aware about, um, you know, what's going on inside, like emotionally and mentally and whatnot. And I thought that acting was a good way to do that. Now, fast forward, you're not really learning to emote um, when you're an actor, like really, because nobody sits around doing that. What, but what you are learning to do is you're, you're learning to uh, be, you're learning to study human behavior, right? Like, and you're learning to kind of pr- practice your empathy muscle because every time you encounter a new role or a new character, you 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 know this because you've you've done some classes. Um, every time you encounter a new character or a new role, you're you're trying to figure out what it would be like to be that person in the imaginary circumstances of the scene or the script or whatever. And so you're you're basically putting yourself in the other person's shoes. It doesn't matter that that person is fictional. It, they might not be. It might be a biography about a real person. So you're you're really, you're empathizing. You're like putting yourself in the other person's shoes and you're practicing this over and over again. So I've done something like, I don't know, 1,500, 2,000 auditions in my life. Like, so I've, you know, practiced empathizing with like thousands of people. 
And usually we don't just walk around doing that. Like outside of an acting career, I don't under, I don't know why I would do that necessarily. But one of the things that I think is actually kind of neat about acting is that you get you get to practice empathy. Like you you can practice it as, as much as you want. Like once you've learned the skill to get, put yourself in the character's shoes, that you just continue, you could do it five times a day if you wanted. You could get really, really good at it, right? And and you, you start to gain this awareness not only about your own emotional life and mental and mental sort of like perspective, um, but those of other people as well. So I mean I, you know, I don't know where I was going with that. Well, I mean, I'm working on a book about that topic right now. I, I think it's just really fascinating, basically. <laughs> Yeah, e empathy is very important. I think um, I, I I completely agree with what you're saying. Like at the moment, um, well, I I did originally start a drama class because I I haven't done any, anything like that um, since before pandemic because mm. I, I weren't going out for a long time um, because of the Crohn's um, and the COVID. So it was I originally was thinking I'm gonna, I'm gonna I want to be a sports coach because I love sports and nice. but the thing is it really impacts me like I'll, I'll do so hard with sports and I'll just get really sore and I ache for days so and then it goes back to acting because I'm always acting uh do different Doctor Who characters in my free time <laughs> um to put on all the, the cosplays that I have on um mm -hmm. and I, I do that all the time and I did start a, a drama class, but it wasn't my level. It was too easy. So what they've done is what they're going to do is um, at my local Mercury Theatre is I've, I've, I'm on the waiting list from now till maybe the rest of this year. But if I don't get on this year, I'll be doing it next year for people more my level. And you get to perform at the Mercury in front of people in the end. So uh, that's great. And you get something out of that one. So, yeah, um. It's something that I really enjoy um, because I remember when doing before the mighty role character at school, uh, a person come up to me and saying that you're you're the best person I've seen do a mighty role character, and a mighty role character is hard because you've got yeah. to change your personality and who you are really fast. Because um, huh. I think I would change from someone's wife, no, not mm -hmm. someone's wife. I'm saying to uh, um, someone's husband to huh. maybe a. Uh, a person in charge and then to someone else so yeah, it can, yeah. It, 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 it's it's good and i guess you got to be careful in a way to maybe not it, it may be a good thing but say if you if you're a really bad person acting as a really bad person you don't want that to be who you are out of acting like right. in your personal life but i think you've got to maybe totally. keep them separate but in yeah. ways that it can relate to you so maybe chan lee you may relate to him. I don't know if you relate to him in your day-to-day -day life um, mm -hmm. in some aspects, but I don't know. Did, yeah, so, some aspects. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, there, there are definitely certain aspects. I I was, uh, especially at that age, I was, you know, you know, like not, not always hanging around like, you know, the most uh, like upstanding citizens or whatever right like a pretty diverse kind of range of people that i would be <laughs> hanging around and so it wasn't like completely unfamiliar with the sort of underground elements that that chang lee kind of came from and i mean i think part of the one of the things that i really like about chang lee actually and i haven't really talked about this before so this is but um it is like his sense of sense of individual individuality like independence you know like the fact that he was so he was kind of resourceful as an independent like person being able to just kind of you know, I don't know, get the keys to the TARDIS and then get in there and, and you know, make that work and find an ambulance to steal, you know, like, or whatever, just like this. But he just seemed to be quite resourceful and and kind of independent, Um, you know, except for the fact that he, he had, a, you know, he was like under hypnosis, I guess, by the by the by the master at some point. But other than that, um, you know, he's kind of an independent thinker, which is yeah. along the same veins. Yeah, like what I like. Yeah, it's good you relate to him in some ways because younger and and, and stuff like that. And you, you yeah. you've worked with Paul McGann, who's who's great, and Eric yeah. Roberts as the master. So it, it, as they were older than you at the time, you must have learned a lot from them, like being on yeah. set with them and uh, working with probably Eric Roberts a bit more because you was I guess you were kind of a little bit of a baddie in the movie a little bit, yeah. <laughs> a little bit, yeah, yeah. But with a good heart, kind of thing, I guess yeah. he turns. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Definitely learned a lot for sure. It was very interesting uh, situation working with Eric. He Eric has this like I don't know if 
he did this on purpose or if it was uh just how it was but he kind of like helped to create this sort of like dynamic that is pretty visible on screen between the master and Chang Lee. There was this almost like a patriarchal kind of dynamic with like a twist with like a demonic kind of twist. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, and he was, he kind of like sort of fostered that like off screen as well. And I think it kind of, you know, some actors work like that. They, as you mentioned earlier, it can be a bit dangerous, right? Like you're trying to divide these two realities and some actors are just like, ah, screw it. I'm going full on into the screen reality thing. And I'm just going to be like that everywhere I go, like during during the production. Um, some people call it method acting. You know, I'm oversimplifying it. But um, but that is a way that some actors work um, where they just like yeah. full full immersion. And so that might have been, you know, that might have been part and parcel. I might have been um, like part of that um, when we were filming. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know what was going on in his head, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What? What? When I spoke to Paul McGann, uh, I asked him, "What would you would you have liked to uh, do, done a series?" And what he mm. said was, he said um, he would he would have, but he he says everything happens for a reason. So I have a yeah. think if it was still in in Canada where where or, or where, where TV movie was filmed, like yeah. you wouldn't it wouldn't Dot Two probably wouldn't be where it is today, like. Yeah. That, like with Disney and and and, yeah. and 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 stuff like that is a bit more worldwide now and we'll probably have the opportunity I reckon to go to mm. places like Canada or, or over the world again because yeah. of the budget they have now yeah yeah everything happens for a reason so like yeah I mean I don't I don't regret how things things turned out at all i mean it needed to be what it was and like <clears throat> it was it was nice i was at the um at the 50th anniversary, I'm pretty sure it was then 2013, something like that. Yeah. Um, I was, uh, you know, I was there, um, just happened to be there with uh, Daphne. We, we had like met up with Phil, Col Philip Collinson, who's one of the producers from oh. the new. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah from the new, uh, from the new series or whatever. And he, he kind of, he did a really, he did a really, he gave us a really precious gift actually and i'm i'm going to assume that he was genuine because i don't think that he would have any reason to just do this you know like it's not like we were roping him into this situation and like kind of interviewing him or something he just kind of like he offered this up like he i think he actually invited us to go and chat um and he was like you know the the tv movie like was this stepping stone right like when they were trying to figure out how to reintroduce the, the doctor after so many years. And when they were like kind of building out the first, the Chris Eccleston um, uh, season that the first, you know, the first re reintroduction or whatever, they wanted to take it in all these new directions or whatever. And, and, and he was like, you know, we couldn't have done that if the TV movie didn't exist, we couldn't just go straight from, you know, from Sylvester McCoy's doctor and like, just like land on Chris, Chris Eccleston. Like we, we couldn't make that gap unless there was something in the middle that allowed us to say, you know, these changes happen. The doctor, you know, can, can have these intimate relationships. The doctor can do these things like that. You know, there was all these things that had like the style of it, the pace of it, all these things had changed through the TV movie and that they like kind of leapfrogged from that in order to get to where they, they, they landed in in the new series and that kind of you know and i you know I, I think he actually genuinely was telling us this because he had sort of intuited that we might feel like that 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 tv movie was like irrelevant or that it was kind of lost to time and maybe like nobody cares about it kind of thing but he was sort of giving us this gift and saying like well no like everything that the doctor who that the doctor is today is that way because there was that stepping stone because the TV movie was made. And, and even though it didn't go to series, like, you know, it's part of the timeline. Right. So as Paul was saying, everything happens for a reason. And apparently it, it happened for a reason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it does. And it's, it's good what happened because we, when we get like what we are now, like who would have thought, David Tennant's back as a doctor from all these yeah. years so it, it's great and like uh do you like from your after the TV movie did you watch Doctor Who like from maybe Chris yeah, Eccleston yeah, 
I've yeah, I've definitely watched more of it, if only just to be able to have some conversations at conventions and so forth. I still haven't like honestly, like because I spent so much time watching TV when I was a kid, uh, as an adult, since I've had kids myself, I really haven't He's spent the time. Any, yeah, I can probably like really in the last say 20 years, I could probably count on one hand how many fingers how many one what um five fingers how, how many shows i've watched like i really just don't watch that much stuff so but um i have i have watched a few episodes of of the of the new series just just so i kind of have an idea of what's going on a little bit right and um yeah no it's very well done very well done very enjoyable yeah and you've got like the it's looking bright the future of doctor who as well because you've got the new new doctor shooty gatwa of um yeah and the new season so it's great it's, it's, it's looking bright um the future of doctor who i think yeah um i i, I just want to ask you if you knew this but there was the recent master in doctor who's played by mm. Sasha the one he actually has doctor I, I, what am i saying he has crones as well I don't oh know really you know oh that. wow yeah okay yeah the, hey the, we're we're out there there's people yeah. out there I mean, yeah we don't yeah not everyone talks about it but it's there yeah <laughs> Maybe there's some more hidden people from Doctor Who. <laughs> right. Know. Who knows? Yeah, right. Who knows? Um, what, so I wanted to ask, um, I, I'll last few things before we finish here. Um, what, it, if you were like asked to come back to Doctor Who, maybe not as Chan Lee, uh, mm. maybe as an, another character, maybe Chan Lee, who knows? But yeah. if Doctor Who asked you to come back but in some capacity, do you think you would want to do that? Or oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Back? I mean, they they asked me to go to the that fiftieth anniversary to help to help celebrate or to be a part of the celebrations and I was very thankful I'm you know very happy about doing that and you know again with the big finish stuff you know they've actually had me playing like different kinds of completely different characters from Chang Lee and that's been really fun so yeah I would do it totally no I wouldn't wouldn't hesitate for a moment it was it's been it's it'd be great yeah and you meet all new people I guess you meet friends <laughs> by doing that as well as well by by going on the set and everything. Yeah, that you know, every show that you do, you you kind of you know you do make some connections, and or sometimes you don't. But I mean, gen generally speaking, there's somebody that you meet on set that you kind of connect with. I don't, I I I I'm not, I'm a little bit antisocial on set, to be honest. Like I don't, um, you know, some 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 people will go to all those all the leads of the show, all the stars or whatever, and like get photographs taken and all this, and and you know try to and try to network and stuff like that and i just i've never really been that kind of person maybe because of the anxiety like i don't i have a bit of social like i don't necessarily just jump in and start talking yeah. to people but but um but i've definitely made friends yeah for sure like from a wide variety of areas you know working in film and tv there's I've, there's people out there that i like oftentimes it's like the crew actually <laughs> um you know, I, get along with the crew. I get along with the crew or or yeah. um more so than other actors necessarily but anyway yeah yeah but it, 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 it's a plus you get to get, it's good that you go on with the crew a lot of people doing a lot of recording and stuff like that and all these sort of different complicated jobs <laughs> yeah 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 um lot 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 last thing before we go um could you give maybe some advice from your perspective as an actor, like maybe how people could start off or maybe share a little bit about how, how you started off as an actor? Uh, just well, maybe people want to yeah. get Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah. I mean, that could go on for a whole another podcast. Maybe maybe yeah. we'll have to skip that <laughs> something else. Um, <clears throat> but I mean, I think the short snippet of it is if you want to, if you want to get into acting, it's about, it's about, um, it's about just like doing it. And, and I, it doesn't mean that like, I know that it feels like there's a gateway, like you have to audition and someone has to give you the role, but especially now, now more so than ever before, you can just, you can just do it. You can, you can, if you, if you know, if you can make a podcast, you can make a, you can make a YouTube channel. Um, you know, you can, and like on your phone, you can make a show, you know, write stuff and just do it. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be perfect or popular or any of those things, but it might be, or even if it's not the act of continuing to do it over and over again is what, you know, is what gets you to where, where you want to be. And if you, if you're, if you love it enough that you would do it regardless of whether it's, you know, noticed or paid, um, if you would just do it because you can't really do anything else, then, then you're an actor. That's that's yeah. what makes it happen. <laughs> I think everyone acts really, don't they, in life. Yeah. Yeah, we, really? we're all acting about something. And I guess as being an actor, you may notice that maybe people are lying about certain things. They might be, <laughs> because lying is acting in a way, because 
you're you're not telling the truth. But um, yeah, I mean, I have some opinions about that. You know, I think it's a very common thing to to think about acting in terms of in terms of of lying and like technically because you're pretending to be somebody you're not and saying words that aren't technically true, like from a strictly like, you know, book, uh, textbook definition of lying, like, yeah, that's what you're doing. But like, yeah. really, I like my opinion about it is that you're trying, you're really actually working to tell the truth. Because if you, if you, so if you put yourself, so if you're playing a character on screen and you're trying to put yourself into this person's like imaginary circumstances and you're just, and you're, you're trying to, you know, you're trying to be this person. If, if you are, if you are, if you, if you bring your own pretenses into that and you have some preconceived notion about what it's, what the person's behavior would be like or how they would say a certain line or the inflection of a certain word in a line or whatever if you bring those pretenses in there with you you in a sense in, in essence you're building a very elaborate lie but if you can forget those things you might do those things when you're practicing but if when you go to perform if you can forget all of those preconceived notions and forget all of those pretenses and somehow allow yourself to just be that person in those Im imaginary circumstances, then in essence, at that point, you strip away all of the lying and you're just telling the truth about what it's like to be that person right then in that moment. And if you can do that, which is, I think, the goal of a lot of actors is to be able to do that. If you can do that, then really you're being as honest as anybody can be. You're taking up, you're taking humanity and shining a bright ass light on humanity and saying this is what it's like to be human in this imaginary circumstances if you were here you would behave like this or if maybe more more relevant like if i was in this situation this is exactly how i would behave stripped of all of the the acting part i'm just being truthful to who i am you yeah. know in this scenario and and so i mean yeah double-edged sword okay there's a lying aspect to it but also i think we're all just striving to tell the truth yeah I think in a way, your own truth, uh, yeah. because because I remember um, when I was at school, I, I was because of my autism, I was very um, very shy. Um, uh -huh. I, I was shy to, so because I, with the support, I would struggle to ask for help. And if I'd ask a teacher, they would normally just say, "You need to try and work it out yourself." So I would mm -hmm. look what other people personalities are and I would try to implement that into my own so I wasn't really being myself I was really in a way acting to be someone I'm not um oh. and I was like that for a while I was I wasn't I was very shy I was very shy to meet new people um mm. but now I'm a bit more confident I guess yeah. after, after doing different things it's growing my confidence but I was like that too where I just struggled to to be myself Yep. You know, and that is a, yeah, that's something that <clears throat> I think that's a struggle that we share. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but w w would you mind just sharing lastly, uh, some more, uh, maybe some advice about like Crohn's uh, from your experience or maybe, maybe just, because I'm, we, as we know, it's hard to speak about. So maybe you have some advice to help other people. if they're struggling. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, to, to I mean, to, to summarize, and we sort of touched upon it, but I think like to, you know, to kind of bring it down into kind of a snippet or whatever is, is that it it's like to not not be afraid to like, talk about it and to ask for help and, and to sort of explore things and to take charge of your own, you know, of your own kind of destiny there, right? Like, you know, we mentioned before, like, no one else is going to do it for you. <clears throat> you you're you're going to have to gonna have to own it basically and say like okay this is my life now and this is what i want to do about it you could choose the path of doing nothing and hoping that other people will take care of it for you but that's not that wouldn't be my advice <laughs> um my advice would be you know hold on to it by the horns and you know carry it because um you know if you're not doing it with intention then you just it's just happening to you right yeah thank you i i i, I... I agree. It, everyone takes their own path and their own kind yeah. of. There's no rush for for anything, yeah. but yeah. um, if you're in pain, I'd suggest just tell someone. They don't, don't have to be a professional at the time. It could be just maybe a family member. And yeah, that's how we gain the confidence that we have very little at the start. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you, thank you very much for coming on today. Um, I'm glad that you 
you wanted to share your crime's journey, talk about your time on the movie and Doctor Who. So I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and hopefully we can meet one day, <laughs> maybe yeah. at, at a convention, maybe to come to the UK. Um, yeah. maybe let me know and then I can see about coming. But uh, have yeah, a yeah. picture, have a picture or something. And um, in the meantime, definitely as you only live around the block from some of the scenes in the movie, go go over there, have some pictures side by side from all these years. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah, we'll do. Yeah. I've, I think that'd be good. But um, to anyone watching this thing, happy 60th anniversary uh, to Doctor Who. Um, mm-hmm. And thank you to Yi um, for, for coming on today and talking about um, Chan Lee from the movie and his crime journey. So thank you, Yi. To anyone listening, watching, wherever you are in the world, and see you in the next episode. Cheers. <laughs>